uh, it's my big pleasure today to introduce uh, the seminar of uh, Sergei Dimakritov. Uh, he is now working at the Institute for Applied Physics at the University of Münster in Germany. Sergei did his PhD in Institute for Physical Problems in Moscow in 1987. And then he moved to Germany where he did his uh, habilitation in 2000. And as far as I know, uh, as far as I'm aware, he works in Germany for a while now, uh, including his current uh, professor position there. Uh, Sergei has a very impressive track record of different achievements, including scientific publications. Uh, in particular, I want to mention one work which uh, appealed my interest the most. It's a nature uh, paper from 2006, uh, where basically the first observation of uh, condensation of magnons at room temperature was reported. And Sergei is there, is the first author of this work. So uh, having said that, I want you all to uh, welcome our speaker. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ivan. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, you all for inviting me to give a talk. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, once, a uh, couple of years ago, now five years ago, I have been visited Korea, uh, Ganju, the time when Peter Grunberg was working here. And it's again nice to, to have contact with your lovely country. Um, starting my talk, uh, I would like first, before I start to speak about physics, first of all, I, uh, I would like to acknowledge a very valuable uh, contribution of my <coughs> colleagues working in my group in, uh, in, in Münster, uh, among others, and first of all, uh, Vlad Dimidov, who is uh, uh, one of the key person in these in this studies. As you can see in this first slide, uh, first slide, um, sorry, First slide, we have uh, co collaboration with many different groups in the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, in Europe, uh, and even in Ukraine. Um, so um, as far as I know, most of you know what uh, uh, Bose-Einstein condensation is. But I'd like to start with magnets. So if we start, if we, uh, what, what are magnets? And to understand that, uh, we just consider a simple, a simple case, um, um, ferromagnet. And it's well known that the ground state of the ferromagnet corresponds to orientation of all, spin, of all spins uh, parallel to each other. Uh, and this ground state has the maximum spin. And the question is, what will be the first excited state? And one might think, that the first excited state will be the situation when one spin is reversed. This is wrong because such a state is, um, is un unstable uh, due to interaction between this spin with uh, its neighbors, uh, this dis uh, disturbance uh, will be delocalized. And instead of such a localized excitation, where in reality, we have something like that. So we have a spin wave. And you see in this, in this cartoon how the wave, it's real wave, how the wave is propagating from left uh, down corner to the right up corner. And, <clears throat> but for, for given spin, if you consider, it's just precession. And uh, quantization scheme is rather simple. Uh, one magnum corresponds to the, the re reduction of the total spin by one minus one. And one can create two magnets, three magnets, uh, many, many magnets. And these, this already tells us that magnets are bosipartic. What is important to, to, to know that magnets, in addition that they reduce the longitudinal spin, they also carry transverse spin or magnetization. I will be using these two words, um, alternability, there is no, uh, there is no uh, big difference for me between these spins uh, and magnetization. What is important that we carry, uh, carry uh, on uh, transverse, uh, transverse magnetization. In a usual case, in a usual case, these all magnets are defaced and the transition, the Einstein transition between magnets, uh, uh, in magnets 
is already is exactly the coherence in the transverse magnetization. It means at the moment as we have Bose-Einstein condensation, we will see that all spins in this, in, in, or most of spins in this magnets are processed in phase. This is a very simple picture of Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay. I do not want to speak too much about the uh, general physics of, uh, of Bose-Einstein condensation. Nevertheless, I would like to emphasize uh, some important things uh, which not always are written in books or, or even in papers of BEC. The, the, the first picture is uh, rather simple. Um, uh, uh, just a, uh, just a quality, uh, uh, qualitative picture. In, in, uh, in classical gas, if you can see, we have two scales. The first is mean, mean, part, mean uh, distance between the particles, but the second scale is uh, the Broyle wavelength position, which is called uh, Bose-Einstein condensation, where most of the particles uh, are coherent and yeah, are described by, by a single spin. Uh, also make a statement that at any temperature, at any temperature, there is a critical density which, and if the density is above this critical density, you can observe the same transition. In other words, uh, the theory, the theory uh, instead of gas, one have a liquid or even solid state. Therefore, um, it is not surprising that from the beginning, as I start to think about this, uh, this idea 20 years ago, for me, it was a big surprise that nobody noticed that the uh, theory of Einstein does not predict uh, that you can observe this um, effect at, uh, room, uh, at any temperature. Another point of, <clears throat> of here, usually um, people, uh, when, when consider uh, atomic gas, the energy, the energy is scale is set up so that the minimal energy of gas is zero. For quasi-particle, it's not always the case. So since the quasi-particle is excited uh, uh, on, the, on the top of the ground state, and I will uh, address this point a little bit uh, ne next slide, but um, for, for, for quasi-particles in general, uh, it's not the case. And uh, therefore, the famous condition for Bose-Einstein condensation, which usually, usually read that chemical potential should be zero, uh, is not generally uh, correct. The, the correct statement is that chemical potential should correspond to the minimum energy you have in your excitations. And this is important for, for our consideration. Um, magnets, we experimentally, we consider um, yttrium iron garment. It's, these are films. Uh, they are very good for experiments because they are transparent one can pr produce high quality films, uh, um, very small coarse field. So by uh, weak field, you can remove domains. Um, and um, if, you if you consider the, the energy of these waves, which we have already seen in, um, in, in the first slide, uh, the, the dependence of the energy on the wave factor, which is shown here, you should take into account three important interaction. First of all, this is Zeeman interaction. And Zeeman interaction uh, is a single ion interaction. It means uh, it's not interaction between ions, between spins. It's just interaction with external field. Therefore, uh, there is no k-dependence uh, uh, for energy contribution of this interaction. This is the constant uh, energy which is shown here by green. So if you're changing the <coughs> magnetic field, the entire spectrum the entire spectrum which we have will be moving up and down uh, by due to Zeeman interaction. There is an exchange interaction, well, well known exchange interaction. And since it's local interaction and uh, the neighboring spin are, um, uh, are interacting, the energy increase if you increase uh, the wave vector of the wave or um, decrease the wave lengths. And the, the contribution of the, con uh, of the exchange is shown here. This is a famous parabol parabolic, um, <clears throat> parabolic um, contribution. Usually, in 90% of theoretical works, this is that's that's it. Uh, people, uh, theoreticians, do not uh, do, do like 
consider only these two interactions. Um, in reality, uh, there is a very important, uh, uh, very important uh, another interaction, which is called dipole-dipole interaction, which is <clears throat> which changes the situation dramatically. In in particular, in confined geometries, in, in our case, this is the uh, film. Uh, the contribution of the <clears throat> of the dipole dipole interaction is so, uh, shown here by yellow, uh, and you see uh, this uh, this contribution that its dependence on the wave vector is unusual. Uh, it decreases with increasing the wave vector, and I don't want to go into details. I just just uh, would like to say that due to finite size uh, uh, geometry here, if the wave vector um, or of the wavelength of the wave becomes much smaller than the thickness of the film, this contribution just vanishes because the compensation of, of magnetic charges in this, in this well. Uh, and instead, if the wave uh, length is large, uh, uh, then you want, uh, this, the, there is the, this uh, um, interaction is very important and very large. So, you, we have three contributions. And if we add these three contributions, we will get the red curve. And this is a real uh, dispersion of the magnets. And you see that, um, that, uh, that uh, the minimum energy of these, uh, of these waves uh, that do, does not correspond to the zero wave vector. So the minimum energy corresponds to some final wave vector and we will see that BC in this uh, in uh, in this system takes place exactly here, not at zero Q. And what is also important to uh, emphasize uh, the difference between magnets and atoms uh, that the scattering amplitude, uh, which is considered in atoms as a constant, which uh, because people consider just contact interactions, um, uh, this scattering amplitude exactly due to long range uh, dipole dipole interaction, it depends on the wave vector. It, uh, the the, the uh, magnets uh, um, feel, uh, feel each other. Uh, on the distance, and therefore uh, the, the scattering amplitude is k vector, uh, wave vector dependent. Um, since this dipole dipole interaction is, uh, is not only long range, it's also inosotropic, the contribution uh, uh, is uh, uh, this contribution depends not only uh, um, absolute value of the wave vector, but also on its orientation. This red curve, which is shown here. Um, we have already seen uh, um, note uh, here. You see, this is this is here. Just uh, uh, note the difference. Here we have a, a linear scale. Here we have a logarithmic scale. Therefore, it's a little bit uh, different. Uh, it looks a little bit different, but this is the same curve. Um, uh, if the k vector is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, the contribution of uh, dipole is different, and therefore the entire spectrum is different. Uh, you see it's by this uh, this curve. But one sees that this curve is, li lies above the red curve. Therefore, it is not important for us because we are talking, we are interested in minimum energy, and therefore we we neglect these curves mainly during all my talk. We are concentrating on here. So if if you think about this minimum, if this think about this minimum, you can introduce the uh, the effective mass, and you realize immediately this that this effective mass is about electron effective mass. So it already tells us that uh, it will be much easier for for um, for uh, magnets to have uh, Bose-Einstein condensations uh, than atoms because their mass is many thousand. Uh, times smaller than um, than uh, that of, of atoms. Uh, also, to just to give you uh, to give you uh, some feeling, this this minimum energy, which is usually well mainly depends on the uh, determined by the Zeeman energy for different fields, it may be different, but the typical value is about two gigahertz, two gigahertz, which correspond hundred millikelvin uh, or ten micro electron volt. So you see, and we work, we work at uh, room temperature. So this, this gap is 
are negligible is much smaller than uh, the, the, the typical um, uh, uh, thermal energy. Nevertheless, the existence of these gaps determines uh, the transition. This is very, also very important. And the last uh, point, which is uh, I'd like to mention in this slide, that since the, uh, we have a symmetry k and minus k, there are two minima, uh, which there is a degener degeneracy in the gas. There are two minima, uh, which uh, happens in, in, uh, in the system, plus and minus uh, minimum energy, and will be important for the next uh, some of my slides. Excuse so me, uh, Sergey. May I interrupt you? Yeah, yes, of course. Move on. So, at uh, this plot, you basically show that uh, uh, orientation of the field determines the spectrum, in a sense. Why don't you just use k perpendicular to magnetic field to have minimum at zero? We, I understand that it's high in energy, but can you design your sample the way that it will be like you know regular dispersion? Well, in general, we can, first of all, uh, you see, these two curves, these and these, they exist in the sample simultaneously. Because if I, uh, if I applied magnetic field in one direction, there are always the waves which propagate parallel to the field, and there are always waves which pro uh, per uh, 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 propagate perpendicular to the field. And therefore, um, if we take just the, 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 the such a field, we cannot choose one or another curve. So, and the, the, the nature will choose in vain because this red curve has much smaller energy and the condensation takes place here. But I agree with you that you can manipulate with the sample and you can create a situation where um, the minimum can be at zero uh, in zero case. But then, um, then we, we have a huge problem, and this huge problem is connected with the fact that I told you already that the magnet carry on transverse magnetization. It means that if we have BC of magnets and, and zero K, I will have the entire sample which process in phase, and that will be very effective antenna, which radiate energy uh, with the, with the frequency uh, of, of BAC, several gigahertz, and uh, the, this, uh, this state will be not stable. It will immediately, um, since it's, it's fixed, since it's, uh, as soon as it's fixed, it's very good antenna. Uh, it's um, radiate energy and BAC will have, uh, this condensate will have additional channel of energy dissipation and we will lose um, the energy. Therefore, it is our luck that, uh, that the, the BAC of magnets in our system happens at non-zero wave vectors because if you look at these wave vectors, the wavelength is about one micrometer and there is a huge mismatch between um, the wave vector of free electromagnetic wave outside the, uh, the sample and the wave vector of the condensate. And therefore this condensate does not radiate free electromagnetic waves with the frequency, with its frequency. Therefore, there is no channel. There is no channel for, um, for energy uh, dissipation additional, and therefore it's so stable. Is it, is it now clear? Okay, can I, can, can I proceed? Very good. So this is, this is the picture which illustrates the spectrum, um, which I have already shown you. You see there are, these, these are two minima, these are two minima and everything else, everything else is above these two minima. So if we thinking about the BC, we should expect this BC at these and those minima. Um, very important things which we should discuss is uh, thermodynamics. Um, BC is a thermodynamical uh, phenomenon, and uh, we work in uh, quasi equilibrium. The question is why we cannot work uh, just in equilibrium? And um, this is very simple uh, the argument that for quasi particle having a gap, there is no possibility to um, BAC at equi in equilibrium. In fact, um, 
we have a minimum energy as you, as as we see, which is uh, uh, non non zero. And this is also also an interesting fact uh, question, which I sometimes get. Uh, uh, get. Why you need non zero uh, minimum energy of magnet? Why do you not uh, realize the situation where energy is zero and then you don't have all this stuff? The problem is, as soon as uh, minimum energy of magnets is not is zero, the ground state is unstable. So you have a soft mode, and this means that you should have a, a transition. Uh, of the ground state, which it's different, it may, might be different, but this is a general condition for <clears throat> the second, uh, second order uh, phase transitions that uh, soft mode. Therefore, to have the magnetic uh, ground state stable, we need to have uh, energy above zero. And from magnetic system, it's, it's clear, if I like to have uh, energy zero, I should remove magnetic field. As soon as I, I remove magnetic field, my paramagnetic samples build domains and the great uh, the ground state, uniform ground state disappear. So I, I must have non-zero positive minimum energy. But on the other hand, the chemical potential which we have in our system at equilibrium should be zero. This is the fu fundamental um, uh, thermodynamical, uh, thermodynamical maxima. So since the chemical potential is, um, is a derivative free energy over the number of particles, and since we can, the number of particles is variables, magnets can disappear or appear due to interaction with the lattice, uh, chemical, uh, this, the number of particles or magnets is defined by this, by this equation, minimum free energy, which means the chemical potential zero. In other words, in, at equilibrium, the chemical potential is always below uh, the, mm, the minimum energy. So no uh, BC possible. On the other hand, in equilibrium, if we can change N, we, if we can uh, re remove uh, 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 the, the, the state of our system from this minima, uh, we can then increase the chemical potential. And the simple case is, so we can just introduce additional magnets and then the question is, what happens with this additional magnet? Yes, of course, we, it's very easy to introduce additional magnets, but the question have over, and you can do it in yttrium iron gas, in all metals, in magnetic metals, 3D metals, iron, cobalt, nickel. But um, the question is, what happens with this magnet? And we'd like that we have some kind of quasi equilibrium. And that this is, it means that we should have correspondence between two important uh, types, spin-spin times and spin-lattice time. And if we have a material where spin-spin times is much smaller than spin opponents time or spin-lattice time, then the situation will be as follows. We create additional magnets due to very, due to very short spin-spin times. They thermalize, give, give, uh, create a non-zero chemical potential. And then if we do nothing, so this chemical potential uh, just uh, goes down due to interaction with the lattice and the system goes back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the equilibrium. So um, and there is not so much materials and I would say it's to my knowledge, this is only one where this re relation is so favorable for BAC as uh, yttrium iron garnet. Therefore, we use yttrium iron gar garnet for our experiment for our experiment. Okay, uh, so experimentally, uh, how we excite magnets? Of course, the very simple, the very simple possibility to excite magnets, and this is to uh, realize the situation or condition of ferromagnetic resonance. You apply the microwave field, you tune the spectrum of, the, of, the, of, of, of your magnets, that the k magnets with k equals zero correspond to, uh, to the their energy correspond to the to or the, their frequency correspond to the frequency of um, your your microwave waves and then microwave uh, create magnets and then you can create uh, many many magnets and make some experiments. But 
we decided not to do that because the magnets you create will be faced with the applied microwave heat. And therefore, since we are looking for spontaneous creation of, uh, of the uh, coherency, we do not like to, to, to use this technique. Instead, we use parametric pumping. And parametric pumping is rather, uh, rather uh, um, known technique in optic, not only in magnetism, but in optic. The idea is you apply not the uh, microwave field, not the frequency of magnet, but the double frequency. And then each photon with a double frequency creates you two magnets. And these magnets not necessarily should be with the K equals zero, uh, because now uh, the only thing that they are sum should be equal to the zero, which is the wave vector of the photon, at eight gigahertz, very small K vector. And therefore, uh, you can create magnets uh, with rather large wave vectors. And what is important, the face of each of these magnets has nothing to do with the face of the photon, because just only the sum of two face is, uh, is uh, connected with the face of the photon. Therefore, um, there is no additional uh, introduced coherence. And we uh, follow the number of these uh, magnets uh, using brilliant light scattering. Uh, I don't want to, uh, to go to, into technique how we do it, but the important things is here that we have Per, uh, magnetic field, this is our sample. Uh, we have, this is our sample. We have some kind of microwave resonator which excite um, field, create magnets. And then we focus laser beam uh, on, the, on the sample. And um, uh, on this way, we can say how many magnets with which frequency or even with which wave vector we have in our sample. And since we can, uh, <clears throat> make some kind of time of flight experiment. We also have um, time resolution. I will, I will show you in, in a few minutes how, how does it work. But using this technique, we can control uh, the entire magnet system in our system, in, in, our, in our sample. The, the, run, the, the physical uh, mechanism behind this system, uh, this, uh, this technique is rather simple. So you have a, uh, you have a um, uh, monochromatic laser beam, and there is a process that this photon of this beam can create a quasi particle. In our case, is, this is magnet. And due to this creation, the energy and the, uh, and the momentum of the photon is changed. There is a, con uh, there is a uh, conservation law for energy and momentum. And therefore, the scattered light differs from the incident light. And by analyzing the spectrum of scattered light, we get information. Uh, 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 we have information uh, uh, on magnets. In, in, this is a quantum um, description. There is, of, uh, there is also a classical description. As soon as the, the magnets propagates in, in within our simple, it's create the uh, uh, the diffraction, diffraction, uh, um, uh, diffraction uh, pattern, uh, and this diffraction pattern uh, 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 create diffraction of the light. And since this pattern is moving, it's not only changing the wave vector of the light, but also the frequency Doppler effect. Uh, and using all this, uh, whatever you description you have, um, you can uh, explain what happens in the system. So this technique is direct. So the signal Bellis signal is directly proportional to intensity of oscillations. That means number of magnets uh, and the precision of problem light. So you can focus laser light and here you see some examples, um, some examples how you can work with the uh, uh, space resolution. Very high sensitivity. We can start with from the thermal fluctuation uh, good uh, frequency resolution, spatial time, and so on. Usually, uh, people use this technique for uh, determination of the spectrum. And if you just uh, choose two directions, incident and scattered light, you define the wave vector of the of the magnets or the quasi particle, which allow to participate in the, in the spectrum. And then, on, uh, by changing the angle of the scattering, you can move over the spectrum. But in our case, we use um, different techniques 
to uh, to integrate already physically to integrate physically over quite large area in the k vector uh, uh, space and then we obtain rather broad spectrum rather broad spectrum instead of, of narrow peaks uh, using the previous text. and this intensity is proportional density of states of magnets which is can be easily calculated since we know the spectrum multiplied by population function and this is a uh, 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 function of interest in our experiment okay this is the uh, this is the first results i'd like to show what we do we excite we switch on our pumping microwave pumping at some time then we start to to to, uh, to excite magnets in our system it means the chemical potential should uh, continuously rise, increase, and then after some time delay, we switch on our light scatter and control how many magnets with which frequency we have in our system. So these, uh, this, uh, this re the results of these measurements are shown here. So you see different curves, which corresponds to the different delay times, and you see how uh, the population of magnets uh, grow, uh, grows uh, with the time, it means that the chemical potential is grows. Fitting these curves, uh, sorry, fitting these curves, uh, we can determine the, 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 the chemical potential, which is slowly increased with increasing time. And what we see, in, in fact, that <clears throat> the chemical potential is increased, but even at this particular condition, even after waiting thousand nanoseconds, it's quite a lot. The chemical potential is still below the critical value, which we know just because we know the gap. And the, the theory predicts us that the curve which corresponds to the critical situation should be something like that. And we cannot reach uh, this critical value. What should we do? Well, we should increase a little bit, uh, a little bit pumping power. So uh, to just to increase more, that we excite more magnets. Well, um, and as soon as we do that, we can measure uh, how these chemical potentials uh, depends on the time for different pumping power. And this red curve is already the curve which we have already seen. So you see that it's increased first and then goes to saturation. And this is uh, due to the finite uh, spin photon uh, spin phonon time. So as soon as you have many, many magnets, the, the relaxation increase because it's proportional to the number of, uh, number of magnets, and then you have a saturation. But if we increase the pumping power just a little bit, you see how the chemical potential very fast reach the critical value, and then it is constant. Well, let, let, let us look how um, these, uh, uh, for these uh, conditions, the distributions look like. So you see it's here. You see it's here, uh, the same, the, the, the same uh, similar curves. And you see that this is also increased. And this is olive curve, olive curve correspond to the mm, uh, critical uh, value of the chemical potential. And we reach this value very fast after 300 nanoseconds. And if we, if we compare this curve with that, that which we ob observe here, you see that there's a different scale. And this curve here, which we are not able to reach for four, four watt pumping power can be easily reached here, can be easily reached here. And after that, the, uh, the, mm, the population increased further. And we cannot describe the, uh, this population uh, using, uh, using uh, Bose Einstein uh, uh, statistics because uh, the, we need uh, much higher chemical potential, we, uh, negative, uh, chemical potential below the critical um, uh, uh, gap. But what is the smoking gun of all of this contribution is the spectrum here. You see, that uh, different uh, uh, different uh, mm, different um, mm, colors of these uh, of these elements uh, at the higher energies. I just multiply this uh, this uh, uh, this part of the spectrum by thirty, and you see this is 
<laughs> sensitivity is good enough that we can resolve them. Nothing happens with the time. So it means you excite additional magnets, you inject magnets into the, into the system, they thermalize, but due to thermalization, they do not change population here. They all goes to here and uh, populate this, this low frequency, this low frequency state. This is exactly what Einstein predicted. And we can make just a simple, uh, that simple um, trick, we can uh, substitute from the measured value distribution, the critical. And if we do that, we see that very narrow peak. This, this is very narrow peak, which we know determined by our, by our optical resolution of, but even there, it is, it is very similar to what people observe in the, in the, uh, in the, in the, in the atomic gas. And you see that even for, if we know, since, uh, although we know that the width is determined by resolution, uh, even though uh, we have that it's a five orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding temperature in our case, and this is already um, you, uh, con confirmation that we have um, we have Einstein condensation. But to measure the uh, real width of the condensate, we uh, we develop a, a new technique. I don't want to go into details. Just just let's tell you that it's some kind of heterogeneous spectroscopy. We reduce the frequency by by mixing. Uh, <clears throat> the frequency of uh, scattered light with the reference frequency, and this technique allows us to um, to get get resolution 200 hertz, not 30 megahertz, uh, in 200 hertz uh, in the gigahertz frequency range. And this um, uh, uh, this technique tells us that the real frequency or uh, line width of the condensate is uh, below one megahertz. And what is also interesting, as you can see here, this the, the profile, energy profile, or frequency profile of the condensate is asymmetrical. The low frequency edge is very uh, edge is very narrow, and uh, although high frequency range is a little bit broader, and we expect it as we see as we saw that we expected that is some kind of excitation on the top of the ground state of the condensate, and we will see uh, that is these. Uh, excitation is the second sound. Um, just um, give you the just to demonstrate. I'd like to demonstrate you the beauty of the technique, uh, which also not uh, also not on the frequency, but also k vector uh, resolution. I'd like to show you how in reality magnets uh, thermalize. So what we do in this experiment, we instead of just um, uh, pumping in continuously magnets. We just inject very for the very short time uh, magnets, and then we follow with the light scattering how these magnets relax. And here are the snapshots, which shows you that the magnets um, relax and go uh, go to the minimum. And uh, and here is the movie. And this point is this is movie shows you population of numbers and the axis is the two wave vectors, the two dimensional picture with wave vectors. And you see how excited magnets, which have a different K vectors, different energy after some kind of uh, thermalization, they go to the, to, the, to the minimum. And this is interesting for people uh, investigating nonlinear physics. This is so-called inverse cascade. So the, the system goes to the um, smaller energies, smaller frequency, instead of the standard dissipation when everything goes to the higher end. Okay, good. That's, Excuse this is me, just... uh, Sergey, yes. my, my interrupt again. So yes. I actually have two questions. The yes. first one is about this picture. So yes. it looks to me that uh, in this picture, particles go to k equal to zero point, but not uh, uh, non-zero k. Can you please comment on that? No, 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 look. Uh, if you look at these pictures, we, uh, this is the time we uh, we, we finished we finish um, pumping, and uh, this light uh, these uh, white uh, uh, lines is the cut of the two dimensional spectrum at, at some frequency, and this frequency is shown here, and the k vectors is is here zero 
zero is, is this here. This is the point where k vector is zero. Um, and, but minimum k uh, vector is, uh, k vector corresponding to the minimum energy is here and it's correspond non-zero parallel k vectors. I don't know why you think that is go to k equal zero, it's not, it's here. Just, just to see, clarify. Yeah, the, the, and you see uh, that uh, uh, um, it means that the most of magnets which we excited are outside uh, our field of uh, our field of observation. So you see that they dis disappear some for some uh, in, uh, some here suddenly, but it's just they move from this side to here during the relaxation, and you see how. Uh, they uh, uh, they thermalize, and as I said, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they are here. They are here. Mm -hmm. They are okay. here, and or, or here, and this is by no means k equals zero. It's by no okay. means. Okay. So you have also mentioned second sound. Do I understand correctly that first sound by first sound you mean actual phonons in the system, and second no, sound magnets. Is... magnets. Magnets in our system, uh, the, the the first sound uh, of magnetic system uh, is magnets, uh, and the second sound in magnetic system it's the waves of the density of magnets. So you then you you consider uh, first magnets with the uh, uniform density in space, and then on the top of uniform density you can see waves uh, where the density of magnets is is changing. In, as a propagating waves, and I will show you experiments where you see how does it work. Okay. Does it work. Okay. Let's go further. So mm -hmm. again, we have two minima, and we definitely have two condensates. Two condensates, and although there is a theory of um, uh, Pakrovsky that uh, who predicted that uh, there will be uh, spontaneous breaking of the symmetry, that this population of these two mag two to condensate will be different. Uh, we do not see that. We do not see that in recent experiment, which will I will show in my one of the last slide. We uh, were able to separate to condensate, and we see that the density more or less are the same. So, but um, nevertheless, uh, if we consider the entire wave function of the condensate, since the, these two condensate separated in k space uh, occupy the same real space, the, the real space wave function should be sum of two wave function with two uh, wave vectors with, uh, with, opposite, with opposite two wave. What does it mean? Well, to, to understand what does it mean, let us consider a very simple, very simple uh, picture of two counter propagating wave. And it tells us that we should create a standing wave. But what like I'd like to, in, uh, to emphasize that the standing waves can create it only if these two waves are phase locked. Because if uh, we have um, <clears throat> two different phases for, for plus wave function and minus wave function, and if these two phases are not um, uh, connected to each other, the, sorry, uh, the standing waves will be written in such a way and the this difference determined your position of the of the knots of the uh, maximum and minimum of these uh, waves. And if it's just uh, fluctuating, uh, the, 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 the wave will be smearing out. So it means to observe in our case, a standing wave of the magnum density, uh, if we observe it, it means not only that our system uh, condensate are coherent, but also that we have two condensates uh, which are face locked to each other. And this is experiments which we made um, uh, in our, uh, made to, to, to investigate these questions. And what, what we did differently uh, with respect to the previous experiment. In previous experiment, we uh, defocus our laser beam. So the focus was about 50 micrometers just to have a good um, K resolution. Uh, here, instead, we focus laser beam very, very tightly, so we can have a sub micrometer uh, space resolution, and then we just uh, scan the entire system, the entire sample, or not the entire, but some field of the sum in the sample, 
uh, and measure the density of condensate. And you see the result. You see the results and in along this direction, along the uh, z, z direction, we applied magnetic field. And along this direction, we see oscillating density between the, uh, the standing wave. And this sinusoidal, which I plot here, is just sinusoidal uh, cal uh, calculated using the well-known uh, value of the k minimum. So it's not a tip of my experimental data. It's just calculated using the known value of k. And you see it's a, uh, the, the, the uh, coincidence, the agreement is perfect. And it means that we really do have the standing wave of the condensate density, it means that we have really have two coherent objects, more, even more, these coherent objects are coherent phase locked to each other. But if you look more precisely in this picture, you see here, uh, there is something very, very funny that instead of three red lines, you have something which happens here and then we have only two lines. Instead of two blue lines, which blue lines which correspond to minimum of the density, we have only one. In any case, here we have some kind of bifurcation, and in a, in collaboration collaboration with uh, theoreticians, we um, we real, uh, analyze this system, <clears throat> analyze this system, and they predict such such picture, which is very similar to that what we see and. This, this prediction based that the system has persistent quantized vortices in one of these condensates, and these vortices <coughs> uh, interfere with a um, uh, second condensate, and therefore we can uh, observe the changes of phase uh, in, um, in measurements of intensity. So this is really uh, amazing. Uh, very similar to what we have um, with uh, with uh, atomic condensate. Now, um, recently we introduced a new experimental dimension into the system, and in addition to the microwave, uh, we introduce uh, here possibility um, to apply uh, magnetic field, constant or um, or radio frequency, and here you see. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, yeah, here you see uh, uh, we measure uh, with space and time resolved measurements of the density of the uh, of the cond of the condensate um, uh, uh, close to this to, to, to this to this control line. You see. In, uh, we uh, we choose the conditions that the critical uh, that the pumping was below the critical value. You see that there is no um, there is no condensate uh, here, and what you see here, a uh, red um, curve, is just a reflection of the of the line. Forget it, of the line over the line. But as soon as we started to apply radio frequency, radio frequency. Um, radio frequency um, field, you see already how the waves of the condensate are propagating uh, away from the, from, the, uh, from the light. This is something which is, uh, you can call second sound, but it's not really because in, uh, below, before the um, uh, disturbance switched uh, on, there is no condensate here. The real experiments um, on the condensate is was uh, different. We increase uh, the uh, the pumping power, and again measure the density of condensate in a similar way as it was before. Uh, distance from the from the control line, time, and we if we put our spectrum into the uh, our life in, uh, in in some some point, we see two. Pictures uh, to 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 two peaks, and the first peaks correspond to, to condensate minimum frequency, and there is a small peak also correspond to the non-relaxed magnets because then uh, the pumping is rather high. But if we concentrate 
ourselves on this peak and plot the, <coughs> the intensity of this peak as a function distance of the, uh, from the uh, control line and time, you see here uh, um, such a, such a, such a uh, And this is clear, clear indication that we have a wave because look, um, if, we can, uh, if we make a, a cut uh, at given z uh, as a function of time, we see oscillation, minimum, maximum, minimum, maximum, minimum, maximum. If we move a little bit, we see oscillation, minimum, maximum, minimum, maximum, but the phase is changing because now minimum does not correspond to the minimum at this point. It's a clear uh, indication that uh, we have a propagation wave. And for, for parametric magnets, which we excited, if we, we don't see any, any excite, uh, propagation wave. So the, the waves, the second sound, propagates only in condensate or at, at minimum value. Really. And we investigated the spectrum of these waves. And it is interesting that depending on the uh, condition uh, of the gas, uh, for example, if, uh, if we have very well formed condensate, the waves, are, uh, the dispersion is linear as it should be in sound. And we measure um, not only uh, real value of uh, wave vector, but also um, uh, imagine imaginary value, since the experiment is given at, uh, at applied frequency, the frequency in our case is real, but the wave vectors are imaginary. And uh, this is, uh, everything is rather simple, but if we have a gas of magnets in the minimum, but it's not condensate, uh, not condensed, we see rather unusual and very uh, uh, dependencies, the, the waves, can propagate even before condensation in the, in the gas of magnet, but the dispersion is nonlinear. We don't understand that. We don't understand. It. Even more, uh, if we if we change the amplitude of these waves, if we change the amplitude of these waves, we see that um, um, uh, uh, if we sorry sorry if we if we change the uh, amplitude of the pendulum. Uh, we see uh, how continuously this rather unusual uh, dispersion goes towards a linear dispersion. If we uh, increase the pumping power, it means the density and somewhere here between, uh, one, uh, somewhere here by, by, about, by about one watt in this particular uh, conditions, uh, we have a, a transition. What is also interesting that the um, the uh, velocity of this uh, second uh, sound depends on the magnetic field, and this is uh, in agreement with uh, with the theoretical model, which was built by Andrei Slavin and Vasil Tiberkevich in Oakland University, who explain uh, um, in, within uh, in frame of sound model the uh, properties of the second sound. Now, I am coming to the final part of my talk. Um, We'd like to create something like magnum laser. So what does it mean laser? Laser is you have a coherent state and this coherent state should propagate. And in, uh, to do that, we created a condensate and then we applied to, the, uh, to the, this control line, some kind of uh, step function current, step function field. And we, uh, and we um, follow what happens with our condensate uh, when we apply this, uh, this, this pulse of field. And what you see, it's rather interesting. Let's, let's consider this uh, curve first. In this, uh, for this experiment, we reduce magnetic field. You see how field was smaller sometime and then it goes to back. Well, but nothing, nothing interesting happens. As we reduce field, the, the, fre the frequency on the condensate goes down. And then we, if we increase the field, uh, the, it's, it goes, uh, it goes, it goes up uh, back to its its natural value. Nothing in there. But if we increase magnetic field, what we what we see here in this particular point close to the density, we see as soon as we increase magnetic field, the condensate disappear. The condensate disappear, and then we goes back. It's appear again, and. Explanation why where is the condensate? It's rather simple. If we 
consider this spectrum of, of the magnet. If you look, if you, if you start with this curve, if you reduce magnetic field, the, uh, the minimum uh, the states corresponding to condensate still is correspond to the global minimum even for states which are far uh, which are away from this uh, from this point in real space and nothing can happen but if you increase magnetic field the condensate which you have before here uh, has a higher frequency and the spectrum just a couple of microns or a couple of mi microns away from this is just uh, uh, this, uh, is correspond to the black curve there is a possibility. There is a possibility just to uh, to have a con uh, transition and to have non um, propagating propagating power. And it happens in the reality. It happens if we now make experiments not only with time resolution, but also with the space resolution. We see how this pulse create uh, a, a propagating pulse of the condensates, which propagates, of course, due to Due to dispersion of magnets, which is parabolic, there is a, a dispersion of pulse, it became broader, but it goes, it's propagated with a constant uh, speed. This is the uh, can, uh, with constant, and it's broad, but the broadening is rather small. What is also interesting, that the total energy of this condensate, uh, of this pulse stay constant. And we think this is a, uh, the first indication that we can observe in this experiment um, magnetic superfluidity at room temperature, which is probably very, probably. Well, um, we can also, um, this, is, uh, this is the last experiment I'd like to, uh, to show. We can also um, investigate a lateral transport of the system because if we put just DC car in, in this control line, we can create a, a, a magnetic well. We can create a well and we can um, see how condensate redistributed itself uh, due to uh, this well. And what you see, this is a blue curve corresponds to the distribution of the, of the, uh, of the condensate density uh, if we have a well. It's not, not surprising that the density is rather much higher in the well than uh, outside. And if we, instead of well, we create a, 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 a hill, uh, the magnum gas is goes, um, goes uh, away, or push away from the hill. But this, those experiments allows, allowed us to uh, calculate or to measure uh, the um, interaction within the magnum. In the, in the condensate, because from the beginning, from the beginning, from the beginning, it was a big problem. Um, one year in 2007, uh, one year after uh, our discovery, there was a first experiment, uh, theoretical work, which uh, predicted that the condensate should be unstable because the standard uh, theory predicts that magnets are in uh, interaction between magnets is attractive. And it's well known that attraction uh, between the particle kills the BAC. And that all it was a mystery during the last 15 years. And then we, uh, and then we uh, here measured and uh, has shown that in reality, the, um, the, the interaction in magnets of condensate is re repulsive. Therefore, it's stable. I don't want to go into details of this, uh, of this just like, uh, would like to have uh, uh, just like to show you a um, uh, simple experiment. We excite, mm, we excite, uh, we, have, uh, we have a well, and we have a rather large density of the condensate in the well, and you see it's a broad. Now we switch off the, the pumping, and the condensate starts to, to die. And we follow this, this process and we measure the profile of the condensate. And what you see, what happens, the condensate uh, 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 cloud become, becomes narrow and narrow and narrow. How we can interpret it, this experiment? Well, rather simple. We, well, try to make a narrow uh, cloud of the condensate, but magnets 
are interacting in this cloud. And if they are repulsing, they remove them, they, they push uh, each other away from, the, from this well. Therefore, for larger density, this, uh, this, this peak is broke. As soon as the density goes down, the interactions become less and less important. And then uh, the, the, part the cloud, the size of the cloud goes down corresponding to the well. This is a direct uh, confirmation that we have um, and uh, we have the, um, the, the repulsive condition. And the last, uh, the last point I'd like to uh, to mention, you, you have seen here that we wrote the equation just based on the uh, on the uh, Gross-Kitayevsky equation. We rewrite it for our case just in, in included relaxation, and uh, there is a value eta which gives us the mobility. Of the condenser, and from this mobility, you, uh, one can calculate linear momentum relaxation time, which is extremely large, extremely large. And this is also for me some indication that one can have superfluid uh, uh, properties. Of this. Okay, I will uh, skip uh, the separation of two condensate because I'm uh, running out of time, and I am now uh, like just summarize. That using microwave pumping technique, um, and we were able to create uh, um, Bose Einstein condensate, condensate of magnets. We measured uh, temporal uh, coherence and uh, um, also spatial coherence of this condensate. We have confirmed that this coherent object. We even observed persistent quantized vortices. We have observed um, second sound. And uh, the property of this second sound are quite unusual. Uh, we were able to couple out condensate uh, and create moving condensate, uh, which we call magnum, uh, magnum laser. And what I have not shown, just lack of time, we were able to separate using similar technique, we're able to separate two condensate, degenerate condensate. Um, uh, uh, in real space. And uh, now we are, we are investigating, studying separated condensate and uh, whether to see whether the properties of separated condensate uh, will be different uh, from the properties of two uh, condensate which are filling the same uh, space in the, the, the same area in the real space. And by that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. What a thing, the speaker. Okay, uh, now it's time for quick several questions because we just uh, uh, finished right at the time. First question was posed by uh, uh, Sergey Flach. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, very nice and wonderful lecture. Uh, I have uh, probably too many questions right now, but let me just ask maybe the most important one. Uh, I didn't fully understand uh, why uh, uh, k parallel for the minimum is uh, uh, non-zero? What 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 is the? Can you maybe repeat again what the mechanism? For yes, that is? I can do it. Again, first of all, do you um, well? Can you can you live with uh, that fact that contribution of dipole interaction to energy of magnum? Uh, is as shown by this yellow curve. So, as I said, uh, to understand that, one should write rather rather complex dipole uh, the equation because you know the problem is the problem is that the dipole dipole interaction is not local. So, if you'd like to calculate the properties of the wave, you should uh, use a mechanism of green functions, and it's quite complex story. But a simple explanation is rather uh, is for me as experimentalist is is rather uh, is the following: If you have a field and you you have precession of your magnetization, uh, is, as soon as the magnetization uh, goes out uh, goes out uh, of the field, 
you have perpendicular uh, component of the magnetization and which create you a magnetic, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it creates you magnetic poles on two, uh, uh, in, on, and two uh, surface of the film, up and, uh, and down surface. And these poles are interacting with each other very, uh, uh, very extensively. However, if you have wave with a rather small uh, wavelength, you have positive and negative poles on the same surface. For K equals zero, you have, for example, at one moment of time, positive poles on up surface and negative poles on, uh, on uh, down surface. And they interact very effectively with each other, or they create very strong uh, field outside this field, which is also, can be also considered as energy. Um, however, if you have wave with rather small wave uh, wavelengths, you have positive and negative charge on, the, on this surface and positive and negative charges on the down surface. And they somehow neutralize each other. And therefore, for large, for, for small wave vectors, the contribution goes, uh, uh, the, contribu sorry, the contribution uh, uh, goes to zero. Now, if we understand uh, that we have this contribution, which goes to zero at small wave vectors, then you should just add uh, to contribution from dipole dipole, which, uh, which is uh, something like one over X uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, exchange, which is X square. And then if you put it together, you have the curve which has minimum at non-zero k vector. This is this is explanation. Thank you. Uh, second question is uh, uh, why is the interaction repulsive, as you mentioned at the very end? Uh, is there a simple? Okay. Um, tell me why it is uh, uh, why it's attractive. No, uh, you said no. I ask you. You said yeah. that okay. uh, theoreticians were claiming for 15 years that it's attractive, and now you're providing evidence that it is uh, repulsive. But is there some understanding for that? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the understanding is the following. Um, look, let us consider the problem of the stability. How we consider the problem of stability. We started with, uh, with uh, uniform dist uh, the distribution of the condensate, and then we create uh, uh, some kind of disturbance. For example, at some point, the, um, uh, the uh, density becomes higher. That means number of, of magnets increases. It means that the total magnetization of the field in this particular points becomes smaller. It means that the then that the uh, you have some kind of demagnetizing or dipole fields, uh, which you didn't have before for uniform for uniform uh, distribution. And if you correctly uh, take into account the contribution of these dipole fields into the energy, you get that you uh, you understand you will see that the the uh, the energy of magnets in this disturbance it, per, per magnets is higher than energy um, per magnets without this disturbance. This means that uh, magnets in these disturbances uh, uh, attract each other. The main mistake, or oh, well, the main think fell, uh, think uh, mistake of all theoretical uh, of all theoretical um, papers before was that they consider uniform, uniform distribution and they say, okay, we have uniform distribution and we change the density of the magnets uh, continuously. And then we measure, uh, we calculate the energy per magnet uh, as a function of the total density of magnet. And if you do that, you really obtain that the energy uh, becomes per magnets becomes smaller uh, from, uh, if the density goes up. But this result has nothing to do with stability because as soon, if you'd like to um, analyze the stability of the condensate, you should consider non-uniform disturbance. 
And in this non-uniform disturbance, the interaction between magnets will be repulsive. Is it understandable? Thank you, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay, so uh, one quick uh, short question by Meng Sun, and then we finish the question session. Meng, please. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm not quite understand about uh, this uh, linear dispersion of these magnets. Okay. I think, uh, oh, hang on. Second, second sound. The dispersion uh, of magnets close to the minimum is parabolic. Yes, I, I'm not. I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, you you say that uh, when you the the later you you, you show that uh, your dispersion of your magnet is linear, but I think no, no. You, you sorry. I have shown the dispersion of second sound. It has nothing to do with dispersion of magnets. Look, how the experiment was done. We create we create a uniform density of magnets okay. in, in sample, and then we applied um, a radio frequency field, and this radio frequency field, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, create waves which propagates over the uh, density of magnets. And now you see, for given frequency of the for given frequency, you can uh, this uh, this frequency determines by shown here, yeah, minus plus minus plus in time. Yes. And this frequency is determined by the experiment. You can determine the k vector. You can determine the k vector. Here, you can give one the absolute value and uh, real and imaginary part of this of this value, and this gives you uh, the dispersion of the sound, not the dispersion of a single magnet. It's already collective interaction, collective uh, excitation yes. over the condensate, and then you you see that that dispersion, the dependence of this k vector of the sound as a function of frequency is linear. Yeah, it's so, a, it's a I'm, I'm, afraid, right? uh, I'm afraid we have to stop uh, the discussion. We don't have uh, time okay. anymore. But uh, as planned, uh, uh, we have a question, additional question session after short break. Right, Sergey? Okay. We can do this. So I suggest that now we make, uh, first we thank the speaker for question and everything again. Thanks, guys. Thanks. And I suggest to meet again after 10 minutes. So those who are interested and in, uh, have some more questions, please come and you have a possibility mm -hmm. to talk with uh, Sergei Dimakritov. Uh, okay, very good. All right, uh, uh, see very you good. later. Okay, thank, thank you. you.